Hello and welcome back. Okay, in the last video I had a bug which I kind of glossed over a little bit saying that uh, it would take a while to explain and so this video is, uh, is looking at that issue. The bug was actually software but to talk about it I need to kind of give you a quick refresher on the way parts of the processor build are working. So here's the fetch unit that is grabbing a instruction from the memory data bus and dispatching it into the bottom of the pipeline. And there's some controls that uh, effectively stop it from doing that, one from each pipeline stage. So pipeline stage one, that controls the transfer bus here. It dispatches ALU operations and it handles decrements. Crucially, pipeline stage one also deals with constant loading. In pipeline stage two, that predominantly deals with the main bus, but it also does increments and it deals with fetching the result from an ALU operation. It also will deal with reading and writing to memory outside of the instruction stream. So it has a line, which is this longer brown one down the side, which also comes down to the fetch unit to say, actually don't access the bus, I'm doing something with it. Right, now let's uh, see if I can write a very simple program to recreate the problem that I had in my code. Okay, so I have switched my Visual Studio up to a higher resolution font, so I'm hoping that's a bit easier to read. Someone commented on that on the last video. So let's try something very simple to reproduce the problem. So it's a constant load. So I'm loading a constant into A, pushing A onto the stack, and then loading a constant into B. That's uh, going to be a very short program. Okay, XOR C comma C should set that to zero. Okay, so here's the MOV A. So then the fetch has been suppressed because the next byte in the instruction stream is the 035, which has now been loaded into the constant register. So then when it reaches the top, pipeline stage 2 should copy it in. But there's no instruction to jump up into pipeline stage 1 here. So there's the 35 we expected. Now this instruction here is going to be the XOR C, C. That's not a memory operation in either pipeline stage, so fetch unit is free to grab the next instruction, which is the push A. So there's a clear of C has happened. The push A has decremented the instruction pointer from pipeline stage one. When this moves up, and then this, which is the MOV B, moves into pipeline stage one, the memory operation here for the push of A onto the stack should happen. So we can see the stack pointer is now asserting onto the memory bus and this line has come high to, or this line sorry has come high to prevent fetch. But here we've got a problem. We haven't loaded 16 in. We've loaded something else into the constant register. That is the 35 that we were pushing onto the stack because the constant register all that does when we activate the load line is pull whatever's on mem data and the fetch unit by default has whatever's next in the instruction stream on the, the memory data bus but pipeline stage 2 is accessing memory and so what it's actually pulled in is that so and if we clock again something else happens so this was actually a MOV D, A instruction, which we didn't put into our code. That was supposed to be a constant being read. So this is the problem I had when um, I was writing a bunch of new code. Now, if you go back to my original video on contention, you'll notice I did predict this. This is um, what I refer to as an invalid instruction sequence. Because we don't have any way of resolving contention between the pipeline stages, we just have to avoid instruction sequences that would cause a problem. So don't have two instructions in sequence which will both try and access memory. But I slipped up and I created that instruction sequence and it took me a little while to go through and debug it. 
So since then, I've been thinking, what can I maybe do to make my life a bit easier? So now I'm going to show you something else. So behind the push A, I'm going to add a push C. So the code here still has a memory operation immediately followed by a constant load. So here's our original constant load. So we've still got 35 in there. It's not going to see any change. Is the XOR C, comma C. So there's the push A. And then immediately behind it is the push C. So the push A and the push C have both been dispatched into the pipeline because the XOR C, comma C and the push A, while it was still in pipeline stage one, weren't claiming the memory. So that one's been able to fetch. This is blocking the fetching of an AVR instruction. And now the push C is uh, blocking the fetching of an AVR instruction. So we get two memory writes in a row and then two NOPs in a row from where the memory bus was uh, occupied. And then here's the move B, comma, one zero in hex, 16. And now it's worked. So the rules are actually a little bit more complex than we can't do a constant load immediately behind a memory operation because the instructions preceding that can introduce a complexity in there. So two memory operations followed by a constant load will work. I had thought maybe I could add a warning into the assembler to spot these circumstances and that would that would be possible, but it would take me a little bit of work. So I've been thinking what else I could do to help resolve this. Okay, so fetch unit. We've got these two main inputs, fetch suppress, which stops an instruction being dispatched from pipeline stage one. And we've got the bus request that stops both the increment and the fetching of an instruction that comes from pipeline stage two. The big data input is mem data, and the output is the instruction going on to stage one. So pretty much the entire circuit at the moment is a line driver. So we connect mem data to it. We connect the output straight into stage one. These two request lines go into the two different enable inputs on the line driver. And then to make sure we get a knot, I've got pull down resistors on these lines to make sure that if we're not driving it, then this is a zero. And you know what? This works. But the question is, could we do anything in order to solve this problem? And I've spent time thinking about it. And the first thing I thought of was, how can we detect the problem? The problem is very simple. If both of these lines are high, then we've got two simultaneous requests from the bus and you know, that's that's the issue so we don't really need to design a complicated circuit for that that's these two lines anded together so let's build that Okay, so this is a 74LS08. These are AND gates. Okay, I'm going to turn this around. Because the suppress input from pipeline stage 2B comes down here and gets copied across. So that's the first input to the AND gate. Power on ground. Second input is a little bit of a squeeze. Comes from the fetch suppress input from pipeline stage one. Then the output goes to the LED. Okay, so this is about to attempt the constant load, but the 
push is going to clash with it, so we should get the error. Nice. Okay, so at the moment we just have this one chip in the fetch unit plus a new AND gate we've just added. Now what I propose doing is something very similar to what we did with the shift unit in the ALU. A four to one selector. Now these come as two channels on a chip, so we'd need four chips. But this means we would have a circuit where would have a two-bit address to select any one of four inputs to the output. So the address input, we would use our two control lines, and that would mean that the four combinations of these two control lines would select each of the four inputs. Almost doesn't matter which way around we put these. So the output would go straight to stage one, and memory data would go into input zero. So if both of these are low, we'd be outputting memory data straight to stage one, which is the behavior we've got at the moment. Input one and input two would be activated when just one of these lines has gone high. And we want the same behavior that we have at the moment. We want to output a knob. And in this case, we can just wire those in directly. So we just tie those inputs to ground. But then if both lines are high, we have this third case. Now what's gonna happen is the instruction that is currently in stage one is going to fail. That's an immediate load. And so the result's not going to happen correctly. So this is what I suggest doing, is we add a latch. We clock that each time the main pipeline is clocked, but we feed memory data into it. And what that means is this is basically going to be whatever was on memory data last cycle. So for this case to happen, the instruction in stage one must be an immediate constant load instruction. So the instruction is going to be contained in this latch. So then what's gonna happen here is that instruction will get dispatched again and will pass through the pipeline a second time immediately behind the first, but this time it will work. Now this isn't gonna give us any clash issue because under any other circumstance, we'd be suppressing fetch so there would be a knock in this slot being pushed into the bottom of the pipeline. I see this as solving all of the current issues. Now what we might want to do is build a two input selector in pipeline stage one that's keyed off the same logic as we're currently driving the LED from just to prevent that, that, that failing instruction from continuing in the pipeline. That will make it a little bit neater but it's not actually going to affect the end result of the, the program. So this is quite a, a simple and elegant solution and it actually gives us a piece of functionality that I've previously said is only really in more advanced processors. It's a simplified form of it but that's very much the kind of thing we're experimenting with in this processor build. So I really like this. Now I can't build it right now because I don't have room on the breadboard. Now, those four multiplexer chips would be equivalent to these four over here. But I don't actually currently have room for them, so I can't do that right now without spreading the build out even further. But this breadboard here is up for conversion to a PCB soon, so we'll be able to have the space to make the fetch unit two breadboards, same as the other two pipeline stages, and get that extra functionality in, which I think would be pretty cool. It'd be nice to have a solution for this, an example of the slightly more complicated fetch behavior. But for now, we've got the error LED, so I'm not gonna uh, be tripped up by uh, writing invalid instruction sequences anymore. So that's good. Okay, I think this is quite a short video. So something I'd like to kind of show off a bit before the end is the Fibonacci sequence code. Now I wrote this in the previous video, and most specifically I wrote this display code. I implemented the writing of 16-bit, 8-bit and 4-bit hex numbers by chaining them down so that the 2-byte hex display would call the 1-byte one, one twice, which would call the single nibble version twice. And that worked, we, uh, we got the Fibonacci example code working, but I said at the end that I was confident I could make it a lot quicker, and that's what I've done now. If I look at the 8-bit one here, instead of calling the 4-bit one twice, this breaks the, the flow up and does two writes itself. And this is a benefit because 
I'm not having to load the address of the lookup table twice and I'm not having to save and restore the return address twice within the scope of this function either. Another optimization I made was that I added the alignment directive to this hex table just for 16 byte, but that guarantees that this 16 byte lookup table doesn't overlap a 256 byte boundary. And so down here, I only have to update TL as part of the address. I don't need to perform a 16 bit add. Then in the two byte version, I use exactly the same principle, but uh, I do all of that work twice after saving and restoring A, and I get even more gains from that. I want to uh, get the camera back out and set up to record the screen, and I want to show you this new version running side by side with the old one. Okay, I've tidied the wires up around here. Let's have a race between the optimized and non-optimized version. So we shouldn't see any difference until the numbers start displaying. Now we should be seeing the optimized version pulling ahead. Okay, so the optimized one has finished and the non-optimized one is going on, showing a pretty clear speed up. Now really the changes to this program were half good optimization and 50% the original code not being all that efficient in the first place. Although a lot of the time when you're getting speed ups to code, that's the case. Okay, so you can definitely see the speed up of the optimized version of the code. The Unoptimized version will be going for a little while yet, I think. It's very pleased to get this warning LED in. So that's going to tell me if I've got a memory contention issue between the two pipeline stages. You could also use the output of that to drive an interrupt if you wanted some kind of exception handling. I've already mentioned that in the next programming video, I'm going to be implementing divide, and that's going to let us make the output over here decimal, but it's also going to be a function I have used for in a number of other programs that I'm planning to write. Once again, thanks for watching. It's great to see all the interest in the project and I will hopefully see you soon with the, the next video. All right, goodbye.